Rakate Yahawa, Rakate Yahawa Shai, the Wadi Yahawa, the Wadi Yahawa Shai, Salaki Yahaba Yahawa, Salaki Yahamashi Yakmalaki Yahawa Shai, Kahala Abba Yahawa, Bahashim Hamashi Yakmalaki Yahawa Shai, Wabra Kakadash, Baba Kusha, Baba Kusha, Baba Kusha, Baba Kusha. Double honors to the elder apostles, a great millstone, GMS, peace and citations unto the hopeful elect. Rakatan the water to all of those who are being diligent inside this truth, and they're doing the best that they can when it comes down to keeping the commandments of the most high heavenly fathers. And not only just that, but they're carrying on the faith of the Hamashiach Yawashai, who is the Malak, and as always make it known, it's all about the kingdom, baby. So to get right into this, I know in the scriptures it makes it known in the book of Matthews, chapter 6, and verse 33, it states, Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, my reason of, you know, bringing that scripture out is because when you seek in the kingdom, it gives you um, spiritual insight. And um, I know I did a video um, on uh, Instagram, the recent video, and that was dealing with um, is the laws for the spirit man then, or are the laws for the outward man? Okay, we know the Hamashiach Yawashai is in the image of the Father. And he's just a shadow, meaning he's a shadow of the image of the Father. And we, who are, who are the men of the Lord, we are a shadow, um, you know, of the image of the Hamashiach Yawashai. And the woman is a shadow, basically being in the image of man, you know. But overall, each and every single one of those images reflects something that is within us you know and in order to see that you have to understand kingdom principles you know and Luke chapter 17 and 21 it makes it known perfectly and many will say low here and low there for the kingdom of God is within you you see the kingdom of God is within you and he wasn't making it to any and everybody you know so that's something that many got to be aware of you have something that's divine within you that connects you straight to source and this is why it's very important to be you know taking this truth you know seriously and not um lacking at it at all you know and doing the best that we can, you know, that's where it comes down to doing the best that you can, and being able to use self-examination, which is of Haggai chapter one and verse seven. And you say, thus save the Lord of hosts, be considerate of thy ways to be considerate of thy ways is to, to be attentive to self, you know, because you want your walk to match up with your talk and your talk to match up with your walk, you know, and through that process and what's going on in between all of that is being able to decipher in between what is of righteousness and what is of wickedness you know many could take the works with the outward man but not realizing that the works are really within the inward man you know when we doing the works it's about the inward man and you being able to share and to give insight to those who are like-minded, you know, through the Rakakadash, the Holy Spirit, you know, and helping them along their way, you know. And um, just to go into this, the Solomon Temple, um, I believe it was a beautiful breakdown. Some parts I'm still iffy andy about, but you'll get the just on what, uh, you know, on what is being said. And, and where I'm coming from, you know, through the spirit, because, you know, there is levels to this and it's true.
truth. It's levels to this truth. And every level, you gotta understand there's always gonna be a devil. Meaning you always gonna have something that's gonna try to cause you to back out, you know, to, to stop doing what you're doing, to give up, you know, and to doubt how about shimmy I was shot. You know? So we can't do that. So let me uh play this uh video. in Jerusalem for almost 400 years. It was the crown jewel of Jerusalem and the center of worship to the Lord. Almost oh. half of the Old Testament writings took place during the time when Solomon's temple was still standing. Understanding the significance of its location, history, and design can greatly add to one's reverence for one of the most holy places in the world. The city of Jerusalem is located in an area of three major valleys, the Hinnom, the Central or Tyropian, and the Kidron Valley. The mountain range between the Central and Kidron Valley is called Mount Moriah. The peak of the mountain is a large protruding flat rock, which is now located under the Dome of the Rock. According to Genesis 22:2, Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac in the region of Moriah, connecting the Temple Mount with this significant event. At the time of King David, the area of Jerusalem was controlled by the Jebusites, the city only occupying the southern part of the central ridge. When David captured the city in about 1000 BC, he made Jerusalem his capital. David then moved the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and began preparations for building a permanent structure to replace the portable tabernacle of Moses that had been used for over 400 years. With the ancient city of Jerusalem being fairly small, David purchased the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite so he could expand the size of the city. Being higher than the city of David, the hilltop would make a beautiful place to build the temple of the Lord. Under the reign of David's son, King Solomon, the temple construction began. After seven years of construction in about 960 BC, Solomon finished building the temple, most likely built over this same protruding rock of Mount Moriah. Solomon also built himself a new palace just south of the temple and expanded the walls of the city up towards the peak of Mount Moriah. The Temple of Solomon was modeled after the Tabernacle of Moses. Because of the many similarities between the Tabernacle and the Garden of Eden, many scholars believe that the Garden of Eden was the prototype for the Tabernacle and thus later temples. According to Jewish tradition, Eden was located on a hill, with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil at the center of the hill. The Bible teaches that when Adam and Eve transgressed and partook of the forbidden fruit, they were cast out towards the east. Cherubim and a flaming sword were then placed at the east entrance to prevent them from partaking of the tree of life, as they would then live forever in their sin. In order to return back into the presence of God, Israel had to symbolically retrace the steps of Adam and Eve, passing the cherubim and re-entering the garden in a westward direction. Oh. The tabernacle was set up in the same east-to-west progression, seeming to replicate the Garden of Eden. The tabernacle was divided into three main courts, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The outer court represented the fallen world, while the inner courts represented a more sacred and holier way of life. In essence, as the priest, who represented all of Israel, progressed through the tabernacle, or temple, he left the world to enter a more holy state, and then was enabled to re-enter the presence of the Lord, passing the angels, or cherubim, who were embroidered on the veil. Solomon's temple replicated the same three-level progression, doubling the floor plan size of the tabernacle sanctuary for the temple structure. As one approached the temple of Solomon, the first thing noticed was the brazen altar of sacrifice. The altar was 20 cubits long and wide and 10 cubits high, 
a cubit being the length from the elbow to the tip of the longest finger, or about one and a half feet. On the four corners of the altar were four horns, horns often representing power. This is where the sacrificial animals were burned, representing the future sacrifice of the Savior Jesus Christ. On the southeast side of the temple was the molten or brazen sea, which rested on the backs of twelve oxen, three pointing in each of the cardinal directions. In ancient times, oxen represented strength, and the number twelve often represented the twelve tribes of Israel. Water from the larger brazen sea was poured into ten bronze water basins on both sides of the temple, which could then be wheeled around the outer court for various washing and cleansing rituals by the priests. Around the south, west, and north sides of the temple were three floors of chambers or storage rooms. The inside wall of the chambers was stepped so as to create a ledge where the timbers of the floors could rest. The storage rooms were accessed by a door on the south side of the temple, with wooden ladders going up into each of the floors. At the front of the temple were two large bronze pillars that flanked the porch. The pillar on the left was named Boaz, and the pillar on the right was named Yaquin. The tops were decorated with lily flower petals and pomegranates. Pomegranates were a sign of prosperity and posterity because of their many seeds, and were also found on the bottom hem of the clothing of the high priest. The main temple doors were made of two large bifolding doors covered in gold with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Oh. The Bible describes the door frame as being a fourth part of the wall, which most scholars believe means that the door had four stepped frames. The interior doorway of the Holy of Holies was similar, except having five frames instead of four. The priests who represented Israel were the only ones allowed into the inner temple. This means that Israel only could enter through being represented by the priests. Once you entered the main doors, you entered the holy place, a large room 40 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall. The room was overlaid with gold and decorated with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, oh. possibly alluding to the beauty of the Garden of Eden. The room was lit by ten large menorahs, five on each side of the room, that were constantly burning, and narrow windows on each side of the top of the room. On the right side of the room was located the table of showbread, which had twelve large flat pita-like loaves. The priests ate and then replaced the showbread every Sabbath, similar to our weekly partaking of the communion or sacramental bread. Breaking bread and sharing a meal with someone in ancient times represented that you were at peace with them and was a sign of brotherhood, love, and forgiveness. Directly in front of the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. The altar was similar to the altar of sacrifice in that it had a square footprint and also had four horns, one on each of the corners. However, on the altar of sacrifice was burned the flesh of animals, while upon the altar of incense burned a sweet combination of incenses. The oh. incense burning before the veil of the temple represented the prayers of the saints ascending to God before the veil, a reminder that before we can enter God's presence, our lives, prayers, and actions must become a sweet savor unto the Lord. Only the high priest was able to enter the Holy of Holies, and only on one day a year, the Day of Atonement. Before entering, the high priest passed through a beautifully embroidered veil woven from purple, red, blue, and white threads. The colors were the same as used in the ephod and breastplate of the clothing of the high priest, minus the gold thread. Embroidered on the veil were cherubim, who symbolically guarded the dwelling place of God. As the high priest passed through the veil, he had to pass these angels, who, like in the Garden of Eden, guarded the way back to the presence of the Lord. Upon entering the Holy of Holies, you would find that the room is in the shape of a perfect cube, being twenty cubits wide, long, and tall. The walls were likewise overlaid with gold and decorated with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Two large cherubim flanked the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the center of the room, with their wings stretching from one side of the room to the other. 
This room is where the presence of the Lord would dwell and represented the final goal and destiny of all Israel. Solomon's temple was not only a landmark for the city of Jerusalem, but more importantly, the dwelling place of the Lord. The layout represented Israel's progression back into God's presence and was designed to teach Israel that it was only through the infinite sacrifice of the sinless Messiah that they could once again enjoy the presence of the Lord. A sacrifice that would be performed on a cross only a short distance from this holy mountain.